Thank you for being here. Um, I'm quite overwhelmed that this uh, hall is, is almost full, <coughs> even if it's short after the lunch. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mark Kleinebude. I'm with Spangotronics, and I will tell you something about how to boot an embedded system, an uh, ARM system here, from ROM code to user space. And in this boot process, uh, every single stage will be, will be verified so that we can be sure after we've booted completely <coughs> into the user space that we have an untampered system that nobody has done anything about with. So why do we want to uh, do a verified boot? Um, because the Linux system, is, the Linux ecosystem is, is big. Uh, there are a lot of um, targets on the internet, a lot of systems that are very attractive for hacking. Um, Linux systems, uh, for example, have you read in the news some, some weeks ago there was a big uh, DDoS where they used uh, some uh, surveillance cameras that run Linux. So Linux systems are critical. They control critical stuff on the internet, critical stuff in the industry, medical, uh, automotive, you name it. And we want to protect these um, embedded systems. Compared to servers, traditionally, on embedded, on embedded systems, there are not, they are not that well uh, maintained as servers. But as I've noticed here on, the, uh, uh, on this weekend, there are a lot of talks about updating and updating concepts. So I hope it's getting better that no old stainy systems with Linux will, will be out there in the wild. And we want to have verified boot because it's a complex software system, a Linux, a Linux stack, the user space, the proprietary application that might be on top. And it's for sure that they might be some, it's sure that they are some undiscovered vulnerabilities in a Linux system. So you want to uh, build defense in depth. That means di build different layers, different shells around your Linux system uh, to protect it and a verified system that boots verified and nothing is tampered is, is one part of it. So I will focus on this in this talk. And it's quite easy to do this ourselves. We don't have to rely on some, some vendor or so because there are a lot of socks around uh, that have the hardware support for doing verified boot and it's uh, at least in some vendors it's um, documented openly and all the software components that are needed for verified boot system are available as open source software. So what do we want to protect? Um, I expect a lot of you guys have booted an embedded system. Just give a hand sign who has booted an embedded system. Keep your hands up. Uh, who has booted um, a bootloader that is uh, somehow verified or encrypted? Okay. And then next step, the kernel, who, yes, okay, it's getting uh, less people. And then uh, who does a verification of the file system? <coughs> and do you do read-write file system that is still verified? Okay, not so many. This is what this talk is about. Um, so we want to protect the whole chain, bootloader, kernel, file system, programs, configuration, application data, and even be able to do read-write stuff on this file system. Uh, because the Attica can, in theory, if he has access to the system, manipulate uh, the data that is stored on the system, and we want to detect tampering of this. Um, so, as I outlined, the boot stages of a typical embedded system, it starts with a ROM code. It's typically uh, burned into, or on the silicon itself, the processor, when it uh, gets powered on, it starts, executes the ROM code, decides where I want to boot from, do I want to boot from EMMC, uh, network, USB, or whatever. Then comes the bootloader. This is typically U-boot, uh, bare box, something like this. Then the device with the kernel, and then finally the root file system. And we want to secure or verify the whole stages every single stage. The first stage on ARM systems is usually vendor dependent. 
Uh, for this example, we use a free scale or now NXP IMX6. And um, the hardware, the proprietary extension they use in the ROM code is called uh, High Assurance Boot or Short Hub in, in version 4. And it uses uh, standard crypto like uh, SHA and, and RSA to do the secure of the booting. Uh, for the bootloader, we use um, Bearbox. So the ROM code will verify the bootloader and only start it if it's verified. The bootloader comes with another key in it and will load the image of the kernel. The device to in it, ROMFS, will check it and will only start this if the verification succeeds. And uh, in this fit image here, there is um, another public key available that will verify the files in the root file system. And if we go this chain from top to down, uh, the anchor here is in the SOC, the next anchor is in the bootloader, next anchor for verification is uh, in the, in the RAMFS or in the kernel, and then when we booted this, we can be sure um, that the system is unmodified and uh, no one has tampered any files. Okay, let's start with the bootloader. Uh, if you can change the bootloader of your embedded system, you have con complete control over the system. This is usually what is done on the uh, mobile phones. If you want to root it, you first put in your, your own bootloader. Um, if you have, it, it usually comes from a, a source that is unprotected, like EMMC, NAND, SD card, USB, whatever. And um, on modern ARM systems, the bootloader is not started. The very first thing, and the first, the first thing that runs is the ROM code. So the ROM code has to verify the bootloader before it starts the bootloader. And this is done uh, on the IMX uh, series um, by signing the bootloader with a proprietary tool uh, from Freescale. And um, the public key that is used, the corresponding certificate is burned into the IMX chip itself. Uh, so the ROM code uh, verifies first um, the certificate that comes with the bootloader and then the bootloader uh, is verified with the certificate. And the bootloader contains the public key for the next stage. So this is how it looks. Here's the SOC, the ROM code runs first. Um, in production, you burn the fuses into uh, your SOC, and the fuses verify the public key that comes with the bootloader. This is the bootloader blob here. First, the fuses, or the ROM code, verifies that the pub key that comes with this is correct, so uh, you are allowed to boot this, and the pub key verifi uh, verifies, um, it's used to verify the signature, and the signature goes over the bootloader itself. So this is our Bearbox or U-Word or whatever, but we use Bearbox in this example. And we have another pub key here in the bootloader that is used to verify the next stage. This is a kernel. Um, because we have to do some configuration in the early user space, um, we make use of the fit image. This uh, comes usually uh, originally from U-Boat. Um, this is um, an image containing a kernel, a device tree, or device trees, and an init RAMFS. And this is all um, in this one image. And in this image, there can be several configurations. So one kernel and several device trees, so that you can use one fit image on a variety of boards. If your bootloader knows what system you have, it can pick the right configuration from that fit tree, uh, from that fit image, and, and boot this. And the fit image can be stored on an untrusted media, like a separate partition or even in the root file system, if your bootloader has access to the file system. Uh, because uh, the bootloader will first pick the configuration and then check if the configuration is valid against the public key that is included in the bootloader and then we'll check the individual parts of the configuration and then boot into the kernel and load the init RAMFS. And 
the kernel contains the next public key, the key that is used uh, for the root file system. Here an overview. So the bootloader has been previously been verified by the ROM code. The bootloader brings the public key with it and loads this fit image from an untrusted media. It first checks if the signature of a configuration that it chooses is valid. Only if this is valid, um, here, a lot, here are uh, three hashes of the kernel, the device tree, and the init ROMFS. Um, it checks the hashes if these are valid. So if this is valid, the public key is valid, the signature and the hashes, you know these have not been modified. And you see here, each configuration is signed. So if you have several configurations in your fit image, you cannot pick this kernel, a second device tree, and maybe leave out the RAMFS because the configuration is signed and you cannot modify this. So we boot the kernel with init RAMFS and the device tree. Um, then the kernel comes up, the init uh, RAMFS configures um, the early parts and uh, starts um, the uh, crypto stuff in the <coughs> kernel. Um, we want to secure um, each individual file of the root file system um, so you can later in the next step do a read-write mount of it. Um, the root file system needs uh, to be uh, or needs support for extended attributes uh, to store some signatures. Um, in this example, we use uh, X4 for a customer. Uh, we used UBIFS. So if you have a flash uh, chip, a naked done chip with UB and UBIFS, you can use it. Or you have a block media or a EMMC that is represented as a block media, you can make use of X4. Um, we want to protect um, every file in this uh, root file system. So what we do, uh, we make use of the integrity measurement architecture, IMA, of the kernel. This is uh, uh, mainline in the meantime. And the IMA contains a hash of every file. So the contents of every file is hashed and then um, stored onto your disk or your flash chip or your media in an extended attribute. It's a security IMA attribute. So far, if you change the contents of the file, you can um, detect modification of that file because the signature doesn't match or the hash doesn't match. Um, when the kernel uh, accesses a file, open, execute, or memmap or whatever, it will load the extended attribute, hash the file, and see if the hashes uh, are the same. So it can detect modification of it. First step, but if an uh, attacker has a, um, access to the system, it can modify a file and just recalculate the hash and write it to the media. But we want to protect it. We uh, don't want to give the attacker a chance to do this. Uh, so the next step is to make use of the extended verification module in the kernel, EVM. So we create a signature over all security attributes. And this is done on your development PC during creation of the image. So you take, again, your private key, create your root file system, sign every file, uh, every extended attribute, which contains a hash. And so you can be sure um, uh, that the file has not been modified and the checksum of the file has not been modified. And the EVM has to uh, be verified against the public key that comes with the kernel from the first stage. So it looks like this in an overview. The kernel has a public key. The public key verifies the EVM signature. The EVM signature verifies the IMA hash and the IMA hash verifies the contents of the file. So if we boot in our kernel with uh, 
so far trusted and verified system. We can see if this EVM signature is unmodified and then see if this hash is unmodified and then see if the file itself, the contents of the file itself has not been modified. Um, this is the first step. But if you want to do read-write, um, you cannot recalculate a RSA signature because the RSA keys, the private keys, are obviously not on the system. If they were, you can, as an attacker, just take um, the private key from the embedded system, recalculate everything, and uh, you're in the system, no one will detect it. Um, so what EVM then does is make use of a, a SHA HMAC. This is a clever way of, of hashing things. Um, and you can then guarantee uh, integrity and authentication uh, of, of contents. But you need a different shared secret for this for each system because if the attacker opens one system, does a modification, and uh, the HMAC gets used, you don't want that the attacker can transfer a modified file from one system to another system. So you need a different shared secret for the HMAC on every system. And uh, we do this on the IMX6, and i tell you later how it is done. Um, and uh, the funniest thing is um, an HMAC, because it's just a bunch of hashes, can be verified faster than uh, an RSA operation. Um, this is preferred if you want to boot fast. Um, once the kernel um, opens every file or touches a file, it will recalculate um, uh, HMAC-based verification and write it down um, because it's much more faster than an RSA one. And the attacker cannot calculate uh, a new HMAC when he has not access to the uh, secret that is used in the EVM. Um, how we do this? So we have our SOC that has been fused, and on the IMX6, um, you have access, if you have booted your bootloader correctly signed, you have access to a unique key that is unique for every IMX6. So you cannot uh, transfer data with it encrypted from one system to another. This, this only works if you boot your system uh, uh, with a secured and verified bootloader. What's that CVM for again? Uh, extended verification module. It's part of the Linux integrity subsystem. It's, uh, it's mainline <laughs> in the meantime. Can I pose a question? Yeah. So um, with this fusing sort of very beginning, um, how, how does it work? So do you need to burn something in, in the processor? The question was, uh, what's it uh, about the fuses? How it is done in the manufacturing, and uh, what does the fuses contain? Um, the fuses contain um, a hash of the certificate that's used or corresponds to the secret key that's used to sign the bootloader. So you have a, a secret key and a public key, and a digest of the public key is burned into the SOC. And then uh, it's secured that you cannot change the public key anymore and that the system only boots if your bootloader verifies against that public key. Does this answer your question? Yeah, but it's just uh, possible one time. Yes, you can. Otherwise, someone could change. So if you program the chip, then it's just burn into it and it cannot change the output at any time. The question was if you can change the fuses. Um, you can only burn the fuses from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1 or whatever, I'm not sure. But you can only do it once. And then you even uh, 
have another fuse to disallow the burning of more fuses. So you cannot change the remaining bits that can be possibly be flipped. You even disallow this. So you can only burn that once and even turn off burning of more fuses even. And this is done uh, in the production uh, of your board in the first steps of testing or you can even automate this in the bootloader. Um, you sign your bootloader um, during building of your bot support package. Then you need the Freescale tool and, and access to your private keys. And then you burn fuses. You can burn the fuses whenever you want. Um, you can, after you've created a public-private key pair, you create a digest of the public key and burn this into your SOC. So this is no material that needs to be secured, only the private key has to be secured. What's going into the fuses uh, is just just a public key or a digest of a public key. Um, so if we, if we have uh, burned our fuses, signed our bootloader, booted with a signed bootloader, the system comes up in a secure way and then you can uh, make use of the unique key that is unique to each MX6. And with this key you can encrypt uh, a shared secret that is, that is used for the EVM. And this is stored somewhere on your, on your media. Um, you can only decrypt it on that system that has been used to encrypt it. And you can only decrypt it if you have booted with a bootloader that has been signed properly. So your system comes up in your bootloader. Um, system is secure and you have access to this unique key. You can take the blob and in the inner drum FS, you can decrypt the blob, have access to this EVM secret. This EVM secret just stays into the kernel. And the root file system, if you want to do read write, you need this EVM secret that uh, sees if the HMAC is correct, then the IMA hash is correct, and then the File is still correct. Yeah. One, one question: How do you secure this blob? Um, the blob is the question was: How do you secure the blob? The blob is uh, encrypted with a unique key, and the key is unique to one special IMX. And you have only access to this if you have booted with a bootloader that has been signed. Yeah. The question was, was if I can, uh, if you can modify the system if, if you have replaced the blob. Um, you cannot <coughs> decrypt the blob. Well, if you just use some random data for the blob, you cannot encrypt it. Because you can only encrypt it with a unique key. Yeah, but uh, the, my question was, because uh, at the first uh, boot, you replace the original yes, uh, we replace signature, the these. RSA signature with yeah. HMAC. Yes. So if an uh, attacker is somehow able to, uh, let's say, reset the uh, file system to the state that there is still the RSA. Uh, RSA, then he probably will be somehow able to modify this blob so it gets encrypted again and no, a different... You, you create the blob uh, in your factory. And you only can create the blob if you have a bootloader that has been booted on a secured system. So you, there needs to be a bug in the bootloader or somewhere else that you have access so and it's can... Inside, it's uh, inside bootloader. It's generated in the blue bootloader and then uh, written somewhere. And you cannot recreate it without having a secure system. So you cannot just boot over USB, then you cannot write a, the blob because you have not access to this unique key. 
is only available if you're on a secure system. Um, the question was how the block is secured, or is it secured? Yes, the block is secured um, by the crypto engine of the of the IMX. It is secured. You can only access it if you have. Yes, but uh, you for cannot. Example, if attacker accesses somehow your uh, file system, then he probably will be able to uh, replace this blob. Okay, whether it's. Uh, you cannot recreate the blob. That is usable. No, but you can replace it with some uh, special uh, blob of your own. No, because. The blob itself is encrypted with a unique key. Yes, but okay. So what you do? It's is it's not a blob. it's not a RSA. Uh, it's not a AES encryption. It's more complicated. Okay, so the my question is okay. You have this blob, and then what you do is you constantly replace this uh, blob. Then it gets decrypted each time you boot. No. It's, it's not secure. It's not. It is secured by the hardware crypto. It's it's, it's verified somehow. It's yes. signed by some mechanism or not? It's that was my question. Is the blob? The blob itself it, is. Is it crypt, uh, cryptographically signed like the bootloader? I think it uses an HMAC <coughs> that runs with a. No, I, I can help you with answer this question. Okay. So No, it's it's used as a the red blob or black blob no. message. No, no, no. Is that, is that just implementation dependent on what the bootloader decides to do? Um, this is done by the by the ROM code or by the crypto engine. So you you cannot if you switch a single bit, for example, in your blob, the crypto engine will say you have tampered with this blob. It's not a valid blob anymore. Okay. So so, so it's it is signed somehow. Yes. So it's not an so AES. That it was encrypted, not uh, verified. I was yes. asking if it's somehow verified. Yes. Okay. So um, we can look at the data sheet uh, after the talk of the of the crypto engine of the of the Freescale. So it's not just AES encrypted. It's a uh, even if you. Encrypt with the same keys, the same secret data, the blob looks different each time. I think the point was just that uh, encryption doesn't apply, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. It had to be more precise. Thank you. Yeah, that, that was the okay. only question whether there is some verification step. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> You have access to the blob, but you cannot access the unique key. You can only 
tell the crypto engine, please use this unique key to encrypt or decrypt stuff. Yes, it's encrypted and... Uh, okay. So what's the point of encryption? To encrypt the blob? Yeah, why, I mean, why is signing is not enough? Um, signing is just... Because it, it, is, it is a secret. It's, uh, it's not, not publicly. This blob is then used as... Uh, the, sh uh, the shared secret of the... So. <laughs> We decrypt the blob and get the EVM secret. It's a shared secret for this HMAC. Oh, okay. <coughs> My application is hacked. It can write data to the file system. Yes. So then the hacked application has written its attack to the file system, and afterwards the whole system will boot happily up and execute. All yes, this mainly protects against offline modification. So um, programming properly, properly your application on doing user space hardening is uh, a different aspect of the defense in depth. But if you have physical access to the system, you usually just replace your bootloader and are, are happy. And you can store uh, secret data with this properly. Yes, with, uh, with making use of a hardware random generator, hardware random number generator. And it's done in the factory still, so. And the same concept, having a, a blob and this unique key to decrypt something, you can put this together and make use of EcryptFS. EcryptFS um, is used to do uh, file level encryption. Um, this has um, the aspect that it works on uh, both NAND uh, storage, naked NAND with UB and UBIFS, as well as on uh, block devices, because it works uh, layer uh, in an upper layer uh, when it's um, working with the files. So every file in the encrypted system, um, well in the encrypted file system corresponds to a file in the unencrypted to the lower file system. Um, the file names and the file contents is uh, both encrypted, um, but the directory layout and the permissions, um, they are in clear text. And this requires two uh, different shared secret for each system um, because of uh, the same aspects with a uh, HMAC. You don't want to transfer uh, encrypted data from one system to another. And um, IMA and EVM is not needed uh, because we use, or the EcryptFS uses AES in uh, um, Galo counter mode uh, where you have both integrity and uh, encryption in one thing. So this almost looks the same. As it uses the unique key, a different blob, this creates your EncryptFS, a EcryptFS secret. Um, then the EcryptFS does the AES of the files in the unencrypted file system, and this <coughs> generates you uh, on a subtree your encrypted files. And you can, for example, store your proprietary application, your configuration, or uh, your database, or whatever, or even secret keys that you don't want to have in your, in your system lying around. Question? Is, is it possible to encrypt using EcryptFS whole file system? And for example, switch to, uh, to the encrypted file system? Uh, the question was if you can use EcryptFS for your whole file system. Um, yes, it is possible. Um, you can do this in the early user space uh, in your initram FS and then switch to your uh, unlocked, uh, unencrypted file system. Yes, it's possible. 
um, you have to talk to your lawyer about GPL uh, aspects of this, um, but it's possible, yes. Yeah? Yes, um, it's an overhead. Um, the slower your system, the bigger is the overhead. Um, we make use of the uh, crypto engine of the IMX6 here. It brings, I think, in boot time like 10% overall, but you get probably more, more CPU cycles uh, left when you use the hardware. Um, on an MX25, we did some analysis and it was like, how much was it? 10 seconds from 30. On IMX6, it's not that, that bad. And when you have uh, re-signed your system from RSA to HMAC, it's, it's even faster. But you have an overhead um, because you boot first in the inner drum FS and then switch to your root. Um, when you can directly boot in your root, it's, the system is faster. So it takes uh, some time uh, doing boot. You get a lot of I.O. because um, if an application, for example, um, system D starts and just maps in your all the libraries because the kernel accesses this library, normally nothing, not much would happen. But with the IMA, every file that is touched gets completely written, uh, completely read in <coughs> into the RAM and then checked. So booting takes uh, takes longer. Yes, but we haven't done measurements on the IMX6. Um, no, I want to show you how it's working. Uh, on this system here, and here have my uh, riot board. Hope it's big enough; everybody can see. And I just plug it in, and uh, uh, for simplicity, I've uh, put these blobs just here in the environment of the system. And I can boot it. It boots the system. And what we see here, um, this is uh, now the inner drum FS. And uh, the blobs are read and uh, put into the kernel for decoding. And then here we configure. Uh, the IMA and EVM. So we say, um, please measure this, uh, don't measure this FS, don't measure debug FS, so don't check security attributes on uh, all the file systems that are exported by the kernel. And then we say at the end, please appraise and measure, so check everything and uh, if a signature doesn't match, please uh, do not allow access to the file. Um, then the system boots. And then we can log in. And uh, what I've done, I've created a root file system, an X4, X4 file system. And there is an application called zip on it. And I've uh, tempered it offline. And I've uh, modified the copyright string. When I want to execute it, here's some debug enabled. It says, oh, the hash is invalid. The command was uh, my sh uh, that tries to execute it. And it says here, yeah, user bin zip, and on which file system it was. And it says, oh, the hash is invalid. And then you get just the permission denied. Uh, you can configure what to do here. Uh, for a customer, we implement here. Um, it marks the system as compromised that we don't want to tr that we don't uh, try to boot it again, and um, then we just reboot and try a different system. This is what the customer thought it would be nice to do so. 
and um, Here's a mounted um, EncryptFS. So encrypted is as well the name of the unencrypted and as well the encrypted stuff. And this is the EncryptFS. And here, here's my file. And it's called bar. And it contains foo. And if I unmount it, here's the uh, file. The content is bigger because there's uh, private keys. Um, there is some, I'm not sure what's, what's in there. It's uh, standard EcryptFS stuff. Um, it gets blown up to somehow uh, you, you cannot uh, get to the original file size uh, to the byte. The file name itself is encrypted and the contents as well. No, I cannot. Um, I cannot access it even because it's, uh, it has no uh, IMA hashes. Uh, when I uh, encrypted, uh, let's see if we can start it again. So it's been mounted again, and the file is still there. Yeah, that f so far for the demo. No, it's up to you. You can try it yourself. Get an uh, IMX28. It should basically work on this. On the IMX53, uh, it should work. Or get a QBB, uh, get a QBox or a write board. This is the one I used here. And try to get it yourself working. Um, for our customer, we have uh, it working on an MX25 and an MX26. MX28 is, uh, they decided to not do it. Maybe it comes back again. The bootloader we used is uh, just normal bare box, uh, current version. Maybe the maintainer has released another one because it's uh, already 2016-10, maybe. Uh, it's all mainline, you just have to um, tell the bare box that uh, your bootloader should be signed. And you need to download the proprietary um, freescale tools to, to do the actual signing. Um, the kernel is a 4.0 with some patches on it. And uh, for offline signing of the image, I used uh, E2FS procs plus patches for the uh, X4. And uh, I'm a EVM utils, these are the tools, and you need some patches for these two. The patches for the uh, MTD utils, if you do um, UBIFS, are, are already mainline. And all this stuff is integrated with PTX dist, but uh, you can do it with your own uh, root file, uh, with your own board support package generator like Yocto. All the components are freely available. Yeah, what's missing? Um, there have been patches around, or they are still around, but not mainline, <coughs> to protect directories. What you can now do with uh, IMA EVM is you can take a file from one location of this system and move it to another location of this system. Um, because the directories itself are not protected. These patches are somewhere on the mailing list, but not mainline. Um, if you want to pursue it, uh, contact us or try it yourself. Um, then we have to do the mainlining of the image creation process, the patches for the uh, E2FS procs and the EV, um, the IMA EVM utils, and uh, the drivers to decrypt and encrypt the blobs on the IMX6, they are not yet mainline. And support for MX53 uh, is missing, should be possible as well, because it's generally 
compatible. And maybe some other vendors have um, crypto extensions or secure boot extension like this. Maybe we need some more documentation. You can probably use it on the on the TI. Yeah. Now um, we have been in this project for I think two years, and the lessons learned. Um, just for development's sake, put your development keys in your board support package that everyone can can build a root file system and a bootloader and just play with it. Every developer that wants to. Um, the keys that are used in production, uh, you can uh, it, not put it into your BSP because uh, this, uh, these have to be protected, um, but you can make use of um, cryptographic uh, standard API PK CS11 um, that all the tools uh, can use to, to read them. You can put them on a smart card or even on a hardware security model that's uh, somewhere on the network or make use of some vendors that do, uh, that have software, uh, uh, hyper security models that you can access over the internet with complicated schemes or whatever. And um, what's uh, really handy for development is that you have uh, some packages in two configuration. For example, the bootloader you want to have the bootloader um, that you can log into, have shell access, maybe even can read out the log from the kernel and do booting from from NFS root, just that the developers can work and the guys who want to debug. And just have a different bootloader, a different bootloader configuration that's all secured, no interaction, no state, no environment um, with your production keys. Just keep that separate, that you can, that your developers uh, still can can work and still can be happy and uh, are not uh, hindered by the, by the bootloader. And um, you can do this also for the kernel. Maybe one kernel that reboots uh, as soon as a security violation is detected, and another kernel that just says, "Oh, sorry, permission denied. There was a problem with the security." And um, during integration, what turned out to be really good is that we regularly turned for every release some of the security features on, um, just step by step by step, uh, just increase the security level of the BSP that was uh, used by our customers. And uh, because once activated, uh, when you get a field return, it's really a pain in the ass to debug these. <laughs> you have to be you have to keep this in mind. Um, it it's really makes no fun if the system is all locked down and you cannot access it anymore. And uh, what we've seen that uh, UBIFS with EMA and EVM, it really doesn't like when you have sudden power loss. If your customer says, oh, my, my clients, they just turn off the power UBIFS in read-write mode, mm, doesn't like it. Maybe it's a bug in the old kernel in the 4.0. We have to, we have to do updates and uh, tell our customers to do so. Yeah, that's it. Um, do you have any questions? Um, just uh, I'm curious that this, this fuse mechanism. I, I know about it, but it yep. so sounds a little bit like a poor man's TPM. <laughs> yes, it's an arm system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and when TPM was introduced, the chip ended up saying, "Oh, it's just a few cents cost." So I would expect that soft vendors also, let's say, at least consider. Maybe on the ARM uh, 64 series that there are more server, server grade hardware, maybe they have integrated TPM there. Mm -hmm. um, you can still put a TPM on your, on your board, but. But uh, you, you wouldn't know of about any board having a TPM chip on it. I, uh, no ARM board. No. I am just wondering why, why it never has. Maybe. I have an ARM32 TI board that has a TPM on it. I was going to ask about TPM. Okay, yes. Um, this IMA EVM was originally uh, introduced with um, uh, support for TPM. So it was the first that it came first up with uh, TPM support, and then 
uh, all the other stuff that you need when you have no TPM is, uh, was added. Yes, you can do this. At least Freescale offers this proprietary method to do so. We take what we get there and the tools are proprietary. Um, and the mechanism is maybe ship windows will listen to us someday, hopefully. Um, Benner? Uh, we have not debugged it yet. Okay. So a customer is very, let's say, cost sensitive and therefore decided to use a naked NAND, not a, a managed NAND like EMMC, then it would be some other's fault if the file system degrades on power loss. What's the question? Um, the 10 second boot penalty you talked about, I guess it's dependent on the root as the size of the root file system, how, how big is the root file system? Um, it's not dependent on the root file system, the delay because um, you only check the files that are used or opened or touched. So you can have a terabyte of root file system, but if you don't access the file, it's not checked. So it's not checked, the whole file system is not checked on a pair block level on, on booting from start to end, but only the files, the kernel checks them when, when opening them or accessing them. Are they, um, the SOC specific kernel parts, are they the same as required for the uh, Linux crypto framework or is it something different? Sorry, for the crypto? The Linux crypto framework. There's <coughs> a, a framework you can use to... Yeah. Um, in the kernel, we make only use of the, or the EVM and IMA uses the crypto framework. And we plug in the, well, it's already mainline. Uh, the crypto engine is plugged into the crypto framework. And if you enable it, it magically just makes use of the crypto engine. Okay, because you said it wasn't ready for IMX53 yet. But that IMX53 does have the, the The Sahara is um, partly supported. If it's not supported, it will just fail back to the software for SHA and, and RSA and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I've got one more question about uh, isn't it possible to move the blob uh, to a crypto engine? To what? To the crypto engine. So, you know, to some kind of, let's say, Ladder or something like that. It's uh, here you have the uh, secret, secret in your in your blog. Your, user space, so it's somehow no, it's it's not in the user space. The blob is put. No, I mean the sec the secret. Yes. It's, it's in kernel space. It's in kernel space. Yes. Yes, but uh, on these platforms, can you move it to? Uh, Secure key storage because usually those sort in in runtime so that you cannot scan the RAM. Uh, no, actually, uh, I mean, okay, if you load this, yes, then you decrypt the blob. Yes. And uh, some socks have the ability to, when they decrypt the blob, to put it directly into their uh, okay. protected uh, memory. Um, I so then when you use the crypto engine. <coughs> It doesn't read the key from either kernel space or whatever. Yeah. It has key embedded in its own secure... To just pass around a handle and then make a shortcut in hardware. Uh, yeah. I think this is possible, but you need first support in your crypto engine and crypto hardware. Yeah. It's, it's not supported, I think. But would be fine. Yes. Did yeah. you... <laughs>